really good to be here tonight. I have, in fact, looked forward to this for, for many months. I, uh, I want to put in a very good word for the variety of services of worship that we offer each Sunday and then say a word about what went on tonight. So at 8.45 and 11, as many of you know, we worship here in the sanctuary in two decidedly different ways. At 8.45, we have a, uh, a grown-up praise band. And when I say grown-up, I mean my age, which is to say middle-aged, which is to say old. Uh, and Dee is one of our young singers in that group, by the way, and does a great job. Uh, that's 8.45. At 11 o'clock, we're here with the choir many Sundays, or a bell choir and uh, the organ playing and uh, in a sort of a traditional worship style. Although since I've been here, I think it's probably cracked open a bit, but that's all right. And then at 11.07, 11 excuse me, 11.07, exactly 11.07, uh, a number of people worship up in our youth center in the gym, but it's not really a gym. It is a worship space under the able leadership of John Hutchison, and John would like to call that service modern worship. I don't know whether that means this is not modern, and that is, but, but it's different yet. And the 1107 Praise Band plays there. That's a younger version of the same. Uh, they led us in the early service this evening at 6 o'clock. If some of you were there, I recognize your faces. You're really, uh, you're really uh, 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 gluttons for punishment to come back to a second hour. Um, and I, I want to say that was an absolutely authentic and wonderful <coughs> celebration of the birth of Christ at 6 o'clock, led by John and, and the others. And uh, I encourage you to consider, if you're inclined, uh, coming to that service at 1107. <coughs> I don't want to take you away from something else, but uh, there's something really neat going on there, and we saw some of that tonight. Would you pray for me and with me now as I speak words of prayer? <clears throat> Lord God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be nothing more and nothing less than acceptable, acceptable in your gracious sight, for you are the source of our strength, you are the rock of our redemption, and on this night you have come Come to be among us. Come to bring us light. Come to give us life. Amen. On this night, on this blessed night, we who are part of the church have gathered together yet again in this sacred space, in this holy place. We've gathered together to make an awesome and audacious claim that the long period of waiting has come to an end, that the era of ju God's just and righteous rule has begun, and that the prophet's hope of light shining in the deepest darkness, that that hope has been fulfilled and brought to fruition and even to fruitfulness through the birth of a child, the one who is called Jesus. From the beginning of the season of Advent, the world ate for the arrival of the Messiah, the Christ, this Savior who will act to unfetter us from our fears, who will die and rise again that we might be set free for life. On Christmas night, we come to this place and space to remind ourselves, even as we prepare to pro proclaim it to others, to remind ourselves of the fact of all that God has accomplished in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and that this is the only, only the first step in the journey, the initial act in God's ongoing drama of creation and recreation, God's <coughs> hard work of reversing the effect of human sin by reinstating the divine intent which was present in the day of creation, but which was silenced and scuttled by the fall. At Christmas, writes Kimberly, Kimberly Bracken Young, Long, who is Associate Professor of Worship at the Columbia Theological School in Decatur, Georgia. At Christmas, we proclaim not only the birth of Jesus, but also the birth of a new creation. Despite what the newspapers say every day, the way has been made clear. The chasm between God and humanity has been bridged by the birth of Christ, and God's reign of justice and peace has begun. This message is made most especially pertinent and poignant to us this year as we've faced in this particular Advent season a nation torn apart and rent asunder by political infighting and societal unrest. Demonstrations and disagreements have dominated the daily news in our cities and countrysides. 
public acts of civil disobedience taken on an expression of common dismay. These events have resulted in a great deal of discomfort in our society, but also, I think, in an emerging sense of patient hope that this nation's founder's vision of a society built on the principle that all persons are created equal, that all are endowed by their creator with certain rights, and that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, the dream that this seminal thought, this founding principle, will finally be achieved in its fulfillment. We've seen ourselves move once again in that direction together. Luke's vivid narrative, which tells the birth of the Messiah, helps us to remember God's divine activity in Jesus Christ and to celebrate God's continuing presence, God's ongoing effort at completing the divine work which was begun in creation. The divine one breaks into our midst, in the midst of an inconsequential story of a child born to a migrant family, a woman and a man caught up in the ebb and flow of that era's political and social intrigue. The divine breaks in in the form of a host of angels appearing on the hillsides over Bethlehem to sing and speak and shout words of hope and messages of peace, words that ring out today. The appearance of the angels, though, at first, evokes only fear. This should come as no surprise to us, for we've heard the same sort of all-too-human reaction told throughout this season in the stories of Zechariah, who learned of John the Baptist's birth, and Mary, who learned of Jesus's. And if truth be told, we too are often filled with the same sort of fear and terror when we find ourselves in the presence of the divine, that from which from time to time invades our daily lives. Be not afraid, the angel says to them, to us, not as a word of warning to cautious us as we cower, caution us as we cower before some spirit, but a statement of comfort and hope granted and gifted to all who sense awe in the presence of that which is far beyond our human knowledge, far greater than our fragile selves. God is the primary actor in the Christmas drama. The primary human actors, on the other hand, in this account, are the shepherds. Those who at first seem quite unlikely to be participants in this saga of heaven coming to earth, unless we take note of Luke's reminder, cast as an aside in the midst of the story, that Joseph, the father of Jesus, is a descendant of David, the quintessential shepherd, king. The newborn son of David, then, is also a shepherd. And like his royal ancestor, he too is, un, is likely to be an unlikely candidate to be God's Messiah, which is to say God's chosen and anointed one, God's king. And yet shepherds are the ones chosen to hear this earth-shaking news which sings of glory to God in the highest heaven and peace on earth, goodwill among those whom God favors. Shepherds were held in low esteem in those days dwelling as they did outside the bounds and boundaries of acceptable society. Shepherds were assumed to live shiftless lives, and yet these men, hardly considered trustworthy sources for important news of any sort, these men were the first to hear the news, and the first as well sent out to tell the story which was broadcast on this blessed night. The Apostle Paul, writing in his first Corinthian letter, demonstrates that this is just God's way that the Divine One constantly and consistently selects ordinary folk to carry out God's extraordinary plans. <clears throat> Consider your own call, brothers and sisters, he writes in the first chapter of that epistle. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world to rejoice. Reduce to nothing things that are. This theme is reflected again and again in Luke's account of the nativity. In the angel's annunciation to Mary that she would be the one to bear the child. In her song called the Magnificat, her love song, her song of joy sung in response to the angel's cry and her cousin's call. In the mean and lowly circumstances of Jesus' birth, 
and in the presence of shepherds at the center of the story. Noah Gallagher, reflecting on Paul's comments in 1 Corinthians, asks, what if these words are about something real? What if they are a hint about the kingdom, a hint about God? What if God were about the business of using ordinary people like you, like me, to do God's extraordinary work, that of announcing peace and goodwill among all, of enacting God's kingdom, God's reign and rule of justice and righteousness here and now and everywhere, in every corner and crevice and crack in our society. Could it be so? Could God use us in such a way? Here is the center of the Christmas story, the core of the wonder and power of its account. That right here in the midst of the birth of a child, Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah, right here, right now, God is acting unaccountably and unexpectedly to bring about nothing less than the reordering of our society and the renewal of the creation that surrounds us. For it is most assuredly true that on Christmas, God committed God's self to our human story. God entered into our story in a most peculiar and particular way in the form of a child born to us, a son given to us, upon whose shoulders rests the authority of the one called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, when Mary's baby was born. Calendars were renumbered. The heavens applauded, and a new star appeared in the sky. The angels sang, and shepherds came running into town. Inquiring wise men brought gifts, and unwittingly frightened King Herod when Mary's baby was born. When Mary's baby walked this earth, people came from miles around to sit at his feet and hear the wisdom that could only come from God. They brought the sick, the lame, and those who were troubled in their minds. The winds and the seas had to obey him because he was Emmanuel, God with us. Formidable demons trembled and ran away screaming when Mary's baby walked upon the earth. When Mary's baby died, even the earth was grieved. The sun hid its face and refused to shine. The ground staggered and lost its footing. Graves opened up and saints walked around while Roman soldiers confessed that Mary's baby Jesus was the Son of God when Mary's baby died. But now, Mary's baby lives again and is seated at the throne of heaven. Mary's baby lives again and is praying for you. Mary's baby lives again and makes it possible for you to have joy. When the angels had left them, the shepherds said to one another, let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and saw Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in the manger. And those who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen, just as it had been told them. This we have heard. This we have seen. This we have been called to go and tell. This blessed night.
Hunter, would it be possible to turn that monitor on too so that the choir can see the video when that comes? Right, and when we show the video. <coughs> yep. Thank you. Now I've, now I've uh, sort of blown the secret. But I had to do it because we had to see it. The ushers are now going to pass among us and give us an opportunity to respond to the gift that God has given through gifts of our own as we receive our Christmas offering. <laughs> 